Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Imagine if the power in your house went out. It did next door, too, and in every house on your street, in your neighborhood, and in your town. No big deal, right? But what if it was out all over your state, and the next state, and the next? And what if it was out not for days, but for weeks or months? That's the terrifying prospect raised in Lights Out, a compelling book by television broadcast legend Ted Koppel, who is with us today. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. I'm Chris Adams, Director of Training at the National Press Foundation. I'm joined by Ted Koppel, most recently the author of Lights Out, A Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. Before that, he spent 40 plus years at ABC News, most famously as anchor and managing editor of Nightline. Mr. Koppel, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Can we, can we go with Chris and Ted? Just Chris and Ted is easy? fine by me. All right. Good. Yes. Okay. So we'll get into the guts of the grid soon, but first off, you know, you've had a 50 year career, covered Vietnam, civil rights, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, uh, Bush again, Iraq the first time and the second time. Why, why the electric grid? What motivated you to dive into this topic compared with all the other things that you've covered over the years? Well, first of all, I wasn't doing anything. I was bored. Uh, <laughs> and I was sitting there uh, listening to and reading remarks that were being made by everyone from the president who twice referenced the danger of a cyber attack on the grid in the State of the Union speeches. Uh, Leon Panetta, who gave a speech up in New York warning about a cyber Pearl Harbor. Uh, Janet Napolitano, uh, when she stepped down as Secretary of Homeland Security, warning about the same thing. And yet it was getting almost no coverage in the media, and the public was paying absolutely no attention to it, and politicians were paying no visible attention to it. They may have been talking about it in, in private sessions. And so I thought I would go out and ask a few questions. And I did, and the more I asked, the more I came to the conclusion that this was A, a very real possibility, and B, uh, the government wasn't doing anything much to deal with the consequences of a cyber attack. Okay, so the notion that the top officials were talking about it but nobody was picking up on it. Nobody was paying much attention to it. Why do you suppose that is? Was it, is it too amorphous? Is it? It's, it's big. I'll, uh, I mean, uh, part of the problem is the, uh, the former head of the NSA, General Keith Alexander, uh, put it in terms of we're up to our ass in alligators. And when the alligators, you know, when the, when the ISIS alligator and the Syrian alligator and the Iranian uh, nuclear alligator and all those alligators are nipping away at your butt, it's very hard to focus on a danger that may or may not be just around the corner. And it's a huge, complex problem. It will require an enormous reaction uh, in, involving a great deal of money. Uh, and as you may have noticed, Congress is not very good at reaching decisions these days, even on relatively simple matters. Uh, and this one may just be too big. I mean, do you think the public is, are we kind of catastrophized out? We, we worry, we have so much to worry about terrorism threats as well as bird flu and health threats. Is it, is it too much overload? Um, Tom Ridge, who was the first Secretary of Homeland Security, I think put it very, very well. He said, we tend to be a reactive society. Mm -hmm. In the wake of 9-11, we overreacted, we spent arguably somewhere between two and a half and three and a half trillion dollars on two wars that are still sort of dribbling on. Uh, we created Homeland Security, we created the TSA. Uh, the TSA alone, if you think about it, uh, already has 55,000 people working for it, has spent since the year 2001 when it was created over a hundred billion dollars. Uh, it can be argued, I think, that the TSA may not be the most efficient outfit <laughs> out there. Uh, when Homeland Security did 
a couple of tests back last spring on the TSA and had agents trying to smuggle through uh, dummy bombs and dummy weapons and ammunition. Uh, the TSA succeeded in uncovering those things 5% of the time. In other wow. words, they had a 95% failure rate. That's not a whole lot for your $100 billion. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the general thesis of the book is that the, the grid, which most Americans probably don't even realize is a thing, although they may have heard it referenced in, in a movie trailer or something like that, um, but the grid is inherently unstable and therefore susceptible to, to being triggered into essentially overloading and therefore collapsing or shutting down. So can you tell us, I see three pivotal episodes in the book, in Ohio and in California and in Iran, that kind of help set the stage for how this could be, how the grid could fail. I mean, what happened in Ohio and what happened well, in California? Uh, let, me, let me back up even sure. a little bit more, if I may. Um, the great difference between the way things were and the way things are is mm -hmm. that the electric power industry was deregulated a number of years back. And what that meant was instead of a large electric power industry generating power, transmitting power, and delivering power, now we have arrived at a point where there are 3,200 different power companies in this country. Some of them generate, some of them, um, some of them transmit the power, and some of them deliver the power. Uh, all of them have to be interconnected. The only thing that is capable of doing that efficiently is the internet. I analogize it to a, a giant balloon that has 3,200 valves, and half of those valves are letting power, uh, are letting air into the balloon, the other half are letting air out of the balloon. Too much air in, the balloon pops. Too much air out, the balloon collapses. You have to keep it in absolute perfect equilibrium. Only the internet can do that. And just to get a little wonky on you here, they have so-called SCADA systems. There's supervisory control and data acquisition systems. Uh, if those are not functioning properly, the system is going to come collapsing. It's, it's going to cascade mm -hmm. out of control. Uh, and that requires the internet. So if someone can get into the internet and into those SCADA systems, then in theory at least they can bring it down. Uh, the man who was the, the chief scientist of the NSA, a man by the name of George Cotter, told me uh, the Chinese have been in our system for a couple of years already, as have the Russians. Uh, they have been mapping the system throughout that time. And they can very likely take it down pretty much at will. So that's, that's sort of the, the overall picture that you have to begin with. Okay. And then what, I mean, there have been a few episodes that lend support to the notion that there could be a widespread collapse. And one of those Although was... Although nothing, you know, n nothing that has dealt with a cyber attack. Right. Not in this country. But, well, tell us about the, for those who might not remember this episode, 2003, uh, the tree branch in northeastern Ohio. What exactly happened there and how did that cascade? Well, uh, exactly how it cascaded, I haven't a clue. Yeah. Uh, but it did. Tree branches went up against these high-powered wires, these, these cables transmitting power across the country, uh, and the end result of it was there was a cascading failure uh, that took out millions of homes in the Northeast and up into Canada. Uh, and before it was all over, I think it took about three or four days to get the system back up again. That was a purely natural event accidental, there was no effort to keep it going, quite the contrary, uh, and yet it lasted for days. Mm -hmm. And there was a joint commission that was set up between Canada and the United States to figure out what had happened. And, and rather presciently in 2003, they said one of the great dangers lying ahead is the possibility of a cyber attack. Considering the fact that that was 13 years ago, that was extraordinary. Not much has been done since then. Okay. So that episode um, 
is one of the is one of the lead off elements to your book, Lights Out, which uh, was out by out from Crown Publishers last year. You're holding that very nicely. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> and um, and and you 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 talk about how there could be this collapse because of the inherent instability within the grid. If in fact the grid does get taken down or does come down. What happens next? How long does it take to get it back up? I mean, the, the 2003 blackout was widespread, spread over several states. Tens of couple, 10 or 20 million people were affected. Right. Um, but I, I, it lasted a few days. Right. Uh, uh, it did uh, come back. How long would it take to come back for the what, cyber attack? What people need to understand, I mean, I had a lot of people in government, especially the Department of Homeland Security, analogize to natural disasters. And I had one assistant secretary of Homeland Security say, you know, we were able to deal with Snowmageddon and mm -hmm. we'll be able to deal with this too. Totally missing the point. When there is a natural disaster, there is nobody out there trying to keep it going. You know, once the snow has finished falling, it's finished falling. Right. Once the hurricane has blown through, it's blown through. It may do an enormous amount of damage, but there is nobody there deliberately trying to keep the power grid, for example, offline. In the case of a cyber attack, that would not be the case. There would be people out there who have mapped the system and who take, uh, you know, who are, who are quite literally trying to keep the system from coming back up again. Uh, there, there was an event, as you know, uh, in Ukraine last December, in which uh, apparently the Russians knocked out part of the Ukrainian power system, but the Ukrainian power system is so antiquated that it wasn't operating on the internet. And therefore, people were able to flip switches manually mm -hmm. and get the power system up again. Their antiquated state saved them. Our advanced state would condemn us to a far greater uh, disaster. So in the U Ukraine, they took it down physically through They took it down bombs, through, a, through a cyber attack. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, what happened in California a couple of years ago, the Metcalf transmission substation? In California, it was, uh, I mean, this was a far simpler case. What they did is they took the large power transformers and a group of people, it is believed that it had to have been at least two or three, uh, quite literally set up firing positions outside one of these uh, power substations and using AK-47s knocked out a number, I believe it was 12 or 13, large power transformers. The power was down and out for a matter of days. They were able to reroute the power. Uh, the fear is, and the FBI to this day, has not been able to figure out who did this. Mm -hmm. But the fear is that it was merely an operational exercise. Uh, and that in the event that someone wanted to do major damage, they would hit several substations at the same time. So, so they don't know who did that yet? They don't. Do they speculate who did it, who may have? Uh, they can speculate all they want, yeah. they don't know. Okay. And so talk about the, I mean, who are the actors who would be interested in taking down our grid? It's an interesting question because the, the, those most capable are fortunately for us least likely. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Russians and the Chinese have the greatest capability. There seems to be little question that they could take out all are a part of one of our grids, and we only have three grids in the United States. They could take down all or part of one of them uh, fairly easily. They're less likely to do it because we and the Chinese, we and the Russians have so many interlocking interests uh, that this seems like a remote possibility at the moment. As you go down the capability scale, though, to the Iranians, who are not quite as capable as the Russians, but getting there. Mm -hmm. The North Koreans, not as capable as the Iranians, but also have capabilities in terms of cyber warfare. And then as you go all the way down the, the capability scale, you come down to groups like ISIS, which have an enormous amount of money, 
can buy a great deal of expertise. And the kind of equipment that you need to, to generate uh, this kind of a power of failure by a cyber attack is available on the open market. So the good news is those who can do it, less likely. Those more likely can't yet do it, but are moving in the direction. Okay. If the notion, you, you, I want to pick up on one thing you said. You said the Russians could take it down, and the Chinese could take it down fairly easily. Yes. What, is, what, is, what does fairly easily mean? Fairly easily means they have been mapping the grid, they've been inside the grid for mm -hmm. some time. Uh, and they have already, when I say mapped it, they know how to attack it so that different parts of the grid uh, would quite literally cascade one into another in terms of failures. Mm -hmm. um, can they knock out the whole thing? Arguably, but they don't need to really. I mean, if they uh, imagine what the impact would be uh, if someone merely knocked out the power in New York City. Uh, what do you do with eight million people uh, who have no power and no chance of getting it back uh, over a period of weeks or even months? It's going to be a real fiasco. Um, so again, we're dealing with nothing but theoretical threats at the moment, but those who have been studying it, particularly the, the technicians in the NSA, tell me they are absolutely confident that the Russians could take out part of our grid, the Chinese could take out part of our grid, and we could do the same thing mm -hmm. to them. But that raises a whole other series of problems. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the fairly easily, which gets to the the industry's response and, to some extent, the federal government, the DA, Department of Homeland Security's response. Um, they say, Mr. Ted Koppel is right, um, you know, the, the, the grid is vulnerable, um, they, uh, people are trying to intrude on it, uh, but in general their response is, it wouldn't be nearly as easy to take it down as you suggest. Uh, one of their quotes from somebody from their, their trade group, I'm suggesting that taking down a grid is not nearly as simple as I think some people who have services they'd like to sell would have people believe. And that's, that's a quote from your book, and that's also right. what they've said al elsewhere. Right. They basically say the grid is more resilient than you acknowledge, that they are constantly wargaming out scenarios to try to learn how to react, um, and that the people who see the country going dark are peddling fear, as well as services for their companies, to, services to sell to power companies to help them protect against outside intruders. Um, and they say for all the, all the top officials that you quote in your book as saying this is a real serious scenario, there are other experts with just as much hardware on their chests um, who say it's not quite so simple, it's not quite so dramatic. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who those other experts are. Uh, okay. I, I name my experts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure who their experts are. Okay. Uh, and quite frankly, I, I have no particular interest in getting into a, a, a pissing match with the, with the folks in the electric power industry. If they believe they are resilient, good on them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I must tell you, when people like Keith Alexander, and it is true, Keith Alexander has a cybersecurity company, mm -hmm. which clearly benefits financially from uh, all those companies out there that are coming to him and saying, we need help in, in securing our services. Uh, but as Keith Alexander also says, there are only two kinds of companies out there in the United States these days, those that have been hacked and those that don't yet know it. <laughs> All you have to do is look at all the companies that have been hacked. We're not right. talking about you know, purely theoretical exercises here. It's happening every day, every hour of every day. Hundreds, if not thousands, of hacking attacks that are constantly taking place. Um, you know, is there confidence on the part of the power industry that they are secure? They talk about all the firewalls that they have. They talk about the air-gapping systems that they have. Um, some of your, your students who are here uh, heard a little bit earlier about the danger of thumb drives. 
Fact of the matter is, thumb drives have done an awful lot of damage. You can have all the firewalls in the world and all the air gapping in the world, and if some idiot takes his thumb drive home with him and plugs it into his unsecured computer at home and then brings that thumb drive back in again the next day, that can be a major, major problem. Are they doing things to prevent that from happening? Yes, they are. But in the final analysis, the Internet was never designed to be defended. Mm -hmm. It was never designed to be protected. The Internet was designed so that smart people, professors, could exchange good ideas instantaneously over vast distances. The idea that someday somebody would be attacking the Internet never occurred to people when the Internet was first created. And when you have a system that was never designed to be defended, it's very hard to superimpose a totally successful defense system on it. I mean, that's, uh, you, you mentioned in the book, a phrase from your book is that the Internet has become a weapon of mass destruction. Yes. And it, um, is, it, is it possible to undo that? Is it possible to rebuild it in place? I mean, what do we, <laughs> no. what do, we do from here? No, I, look, I analogize it to what happened with automobiles. Uh, I think if, if someone had told our great-grandparents uh, in the early days of the automobile that the day would come that having automobiles in this country would cost 50,000 American lives a year, mm -hmm. which is what it was back in the 70s. It's now down to about 35,000. Think about it, how, how absolutely immune we have become. Uh, you know, we become terrified by the notion of terrorist attacks in this country. Over the past year, just for the right. record, uh, I think we've had 47 people die of Islamic terrorist attacks, and about 50 people die of right-wing Christian terrorist attacks. We've also had 35,000 people die on our highways. Are we worried about that? Are we concerned about that? Not anymore, because we have become so thoroughly dependent on the automobile that we don't, we don't see that anymore as being a problem that needs to be addressed in a draconian fashion. We have limited the number of deaths. Um, the same thing has happened with the Internet. When the Internet was first created, nobody imagined that it could become as intrusive as it has become, that it could become as much of a potential danger to our infrastructure as it has become. But keeping those 3,200 electric power companies connected and functioning requires an absolute perfect balance between generated power and delivered power. Only the Internet can do that, and the Internet is vulnerable. I mean, you quote General Keith Alexander, former director of the NS National Security Agency, when he's talking about the effect of deregulation and those 3,200 companies um, as on the small companies. It's not that they're bad, it's just that they don't have the infrastructure, the resource to do what actually needs to be done. Sure. Do you get a sense, are the big companies, are they more responsive, are they able to respond and the oh, small they, companies are they, they are spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to defend their system. But the point that General Alexander makes is if you can get into one of the smaller, less profitable companies that does not have the money and has even less of an inclination to spend what money they do have on cybersecurity, you get into one of those companies, ultimately you can work your way back through the system mm -hmm. to the larger companies. Okay. So, if in fact somebody does take down the grid, we go to step two, which is how does, how does the country respond and in the aftermath, how, how, how do we as citizens respond? First of all, tell me a little bit, a little bit about the federal government's response. You had a, an interesting conversation with uh, Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson um, in which he basically said, don't be too alarmed, we know what to do, and you asked him a little bit more about what it is 
to do. Yeah, I actually I'm not sure that he ever was as reassuring as saying we know what to do. Okay. His his recommendation was that everybody get a battery powered radio mm -hmm. so that in the event of a massive power outage, uh, the government would be able to communicate what to do over those battery powered radios. And my question was A, um, if if you have a plan that you're going to communicate over those battery powered radios, why not share it now before people are panicked and before people you know, really don't have the wherewithal to do anything about it? Uh, and I kept pressing him on the issue of what is the plan, what is the plan, is there a plan? Uh, and at, at one point in frustration, he just pointed to a bunch of white binders on a shelf behind him and said, I'm sure there's a plan up there somewhere. Right. Bottom line, um, A, I don't believe there is a plan, and B, if there is, I don't believe Secretary Johnson knows what it is. Okay. Um, and that, it was in that conversation that you had the Snowmageddon quote from, yes, from the uh, Assistant no, Secretary of Public Affairs for DHS. We had Snowmageddon and we got through it. We got through Snowmageddon. Right. For those of you not in the D.C. area. It was a bad storm. It was a bad storm that, yes. you know, knocked out power, power for six, eight days in some parts of the area. Right. Um, even today, I mean, I checked the uh, DHS's website and the FEMA's website the last couple of days. Um, and they say on ready.gov, in, in case of an ele electrical outage, have water one gallon per day per person for at least three days. Um, for drinking and sanitation, food, at least a three-day supply of non-perishable food. Uh, the DHS also pointed me to the FEMA website, which actually has a section called Know Your Hazards on America's Preparathon, and they talk about earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, or tornadoes, wildfires, wildfires, and winter storms, all of which can come with outages also, but they, they don't specifically talk about outages. No, they, they talk about everything short of death of your firstborn. Mm -hmm but they do not talk about the possibility, let alone the likelihood, mm -hmm. of a cyber attack on the power grid. Uh, and I, I get, look, the, the man who heads up FEMA, Craig Fugate, uh, is, is one of the few genuine grown-ups that, that I met in government uh, who has a responsibility for dealing with this kind of thing. And, and he put it in very blunt language when I said, you know, what's the plan? He said the plan is to keep the number of deaths down as low as we possibly can. Wow. Uh, and he was talking about the need to bring in emergency generators. I mean, the kinds of things that people don't think about. It's not just food. It's not just water. Uh, it's also in a city like New York, for example, or Chicago, L.A., uh, disposing of all that human waste. After two or three days, that becomes a massive health crisis. If you can't flush the toilet, you're in trouble. Right. So Fugate, I mean, you quote him. You first quote Jay Johnson, of the secretary of DHS, saying, right. I'm sure FEMA has the capability to bring in backup transformers. Right. A few pages later, you quote Craig Fugate, administrator of FEMA. Most people expect that somehow we have enough tools in the tool shed to get power turned back on quickly. The answer is no. That's correct. And do you think, I mean, is, and he was, he was shooting straight with you. He was. I think, he, I think he's an extraordinary, uh, he, he is a remarkable entity for a government official uh, in that he clearly has great job security because he's <laughs> not worried about speaking bluntly. And he did speak very bluntly. And um, I, I know that uh, some of your, your, um, Young journalists here today have already heard about the, the large power transformers. Uh, we don't even know in this country, because it is a closely held secret by the power industry, how many large power transformers there are. What we do know is that very few of them are made in this country, that almost all of them are custom made. In other words, they're not interchangeable. And therefore, if one of them goes out, or if a dozen of them go out, and you need new large power transformers, they have to be ordered from overseas. And the time from ordering to delivery is about a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 
and actually bringing them in, you, you talk about how massive these things are. Well, they're, four, they're 400 to 600,000 pounds. Uh, and, and some of the, I mean, they're so old, on average, they're 38 years old. Yeah. Uh, and some of them uh, were first delivered so many years ago that the rail system on which they were delivered no longer exists. So get, getting a new 600,000 pound transformer in to replace the one that's gone down is going to be something of a challenge. The Home Depot, guy, Home Depot guys can't deliver it? Uh, you can try Federal Express, but I'm not sure they can handle it. Okay. Right. So, um, so let's talk about what comes next. The, the grid has been taken out. The backup transformers are slow, very slow to materialize. Uh, you know, the, the federal government has limited information on what to do beyond the three, day, three days of food and water that you would need. Um, what comes next? What, what, what happens to well, folks in big cities? What happens to folks in rural areas? Let's talk about what comes first, if you okay, don't mind. Sure. So the, the president is sitting in the Situation Room, and he brings all of his intelligence people in. And he says, all right, so how bad is it? It's bad, Mr. President, 10 states are down. We probably have about 30 million people without power, and it's going to take us a while. Mm -hmm. And the president's first question is, all right, who did it? And the answer is, sir, we don't know. The problem with a cyber attack, unlike a nuclear attack, where uh, we would immediately have known where the, where the missiles came from. In the case of a cyber attack, we don't know. You have only to think back to the, the attack on Sony Pictures, which everybody in the country assumed almost immediately came from North Korea, because Sony Pictures had just put out that goofy movie making fun of Kim Jong-un. Um, and yet, even though that was the, the obvious assumption, it took the FBI a couple of months before they were able to say with certainty that the North Koreans had done this. When you don't have <laughs> those kinds of obvious clues as to where the attack came from, and when an attack can be routed and rerouted through any number of different locations around the world, you may never know who did it. And if you don't know who did it, you can't respond. And if there is some question about your ability to respond, then the inhibitions on America's enemies to launch this kind of attack are, if not eliminated, certainly reduced. Hmm. So, so that's what comes first. Then, then, then what do we do? Then what do we do? Out. All right, well, for example, let's talk about food. Yeah. Uh, in New York State, I talked to the, the man who headed up New York State Homeland Security. And I said, how much food have you got? Oh, he said, we've got about, uh, I think he said about 23 million MREs, meals ready to eat. And I did a little bit of quick math and said, all right, so even in New York City, you've got 8 million people. So essentially, you got three meals per person. And even though there are a lot of calories in one of those MREs, let's say one MRE a day mm -hmm. per person, you're out of food in three days. And he said, that's right. Where does the food come from at that point? Well, he said, there's going to be a lot of competition among the states, right? Other states that have been, that have been attacked. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, because MREs have a shelf life of only five years, the federal government has not bought that many MREs because it doesn't want to be stuck with tens of millions of MREs that are going to go bad on them after five years. Therefore, we are in a situation when you assume the federal government's going to be able to provide the food. Not so fast. They won't. Right. Uh, they could if they substituted freeze-dried meals for MREs. Freeze-dried meals have a shelf life of 25 to 30 years. But if we were to begin tomorrow, it would still take two or three years to acquire the number of, of freeze-dried food packages that would take care of, let's say, 20 or 30 million people for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. 
So who actually in the country is kind of getting prepared on this? You well, spent a few chapters I, talking I about the preppers. Tell me who the preppers are. Well, actually, I don't spend that much time on the preppers. I do spend three chapters on the Mormons. Right, but right. There, there are people in this country who have been anticipating uh, you know, black UN helicopters flying over the United States, uh, and and uh, you know, nuclear attacks. Uh, there, there have been survivalists in this country for many years. There is a a less politicized uh, and and actually far more moderate group of people who call themselves preppers, mm -hmm. as in those who are prepared. Uh, there may be two or three million of those people in the country. Uh, some of them are, are wildly prepared. I mean, <laughs> prepared to the point of having many guns and thousands of rounds of ammunition uh, and water storage for a year and food storage for six months. Most are not. Most are far more modestly prepared. Um, I spent three chapters uh, focusing on the Mormons because the Mormon church as an entity, as an organization, has been anticipating disaster for 150 years. Uh, they were sort of pushed from pillar to post in this country during their early years, ultimately ended up out at the Great Salt Lake precisely because they thought it was a place that nobody else wanted and nobody else would come to. The, the Mormon Church has an extraordinary organization from the top down, from the bottom up. Mormons are encouraged to have at least a three to six month supply of food and water in their homes, and many, if not most, do. Okay. So um, you have, you have the, a fascinating uh, episode in your book where you, uh, or interesting episode in your, with your book, where you actually go talk to the local fire. Wait a second, it's gone from fascinating to merely interesting? In, it's, it's, in it, was okay. it was okay. It was okay. Right. It was okay. It was mildly interesting. There you go. Um, you went and talked to the local fire chief about about first responders and what my, they would do. And well, so, my local fire right. chief, and the reason I did this is um, I was talking to um, a former secretary of Homeland Security. And what he said to me was essentially the same thing that the, uh, uh, the current secretary of Homeland Security said, namely, get a battery powered radio. <laughs> But he also said, you know, go to your local fire station because they're going to be able to help you. Yeah. So I figured, okay, I'll go to my local fire station. And I went to my local fire station in Potomac, Maryland, asked to talk to the chief, told him what the premise of my book was, and, and said, you know, what do you do? And he said, well, we, we have emergency supplies of food and water. Yeah. I said, really? For all of us? Oh, no, he said, for the first responders. I said, well, that's very reassuring. I'm glad you guys are taken care of. But if the power goes out um, for all of us, what are you going to do for the rest of us? And he said, look, I'm retiring in two years, and I just hope it doesn't happen before then. Okay. So, so th the, the guys in the fire station are sitting around, not on a, out on a run, and Ted Koppel walks up and... and, and uh, and you just found the fire chief there that way? Well, no, I asked, to, asked yeah. to talk to him. I told him what I was doing, and, and uh, you know, he was very gracious in terms of sitting down with me and talking to me. Okay. So, um, so I have a question from, question from one of our viewers, uh, a very basic question. Why do you think a major cyber attack in the U.S. hasn't occurred yet? Because, as I said at the outset, those who can do it have no particular motive to do it right now and have all kinds of motives not to do it. Uh, and those who have the motives to do it, uh, terrorist groups like ISIS, don't yet have the capability. Is the capability out there? Absolutely. We could do it to the Chinese. We could do it to the Russians. We could do it, interestingly enough, uh, we were the first to use, we and the Israelis, to use a, a cyber attack uh, against the nuclear infrastructure in Iran in a place called Natanz. Um, so, you know, the United States unleashed this particular genie 
uh, as many years ago we unleashed the nuclear genie, and now we're trying to stuff it back in the bottle again. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the reaction to the book and to your, your central thesis. Um, you know, I, I talked a little bit about what the, the electric industry has said and, and, and some of the response from DHS. Um, I mean, what are you hearing from, from other experts in the field, and what are you hearing from people that you're meeting, you know, at, at speaking engagements and so forth? Well, first of all, as all journalists know, you have to listen very carefully to the response. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you go back and you reread the response that came from the electric power industry itself, um, the, the response was kind of a snarky one in the sense, not snarky in terms of being directed against me, but snarky in the sense of it's not nearly as easy as some of those in the, you can read the exact quote, but right. some of those in the industry of, of selling cyber protection would have us believe. A, nobody said it was easy. And I make a particular point uh, in Lights Out of saying this is not easy. It's very complex. It has taken years for both the Russians and the Chinese to penetrate the system and to map the system. So A, it's not easy. B, if the folks who are now running cybersecurity companies were the only ones warning about the danger of a cyber attack on the power grid, I would probably share the, the power industry spokesman's point of view, but they're not. Uh, I mean, first of all, the president has warned about it twice to the, I mean, in State of the Union speeches. To the best of my knowledge, uh, you know, I don't think he has secured a post yet in the cybersecurity business. The Secretary of, of Defense, Leon Panetta, made the same point. He's now running the Panetta Institute out in California. He derives no financial benefit that I'm aware of from having made this kind of warning. Uh, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet, Janet uh, Napolitano, uh, is now the president of the University of California. She derives no benefit. So there, there are plenty of responsible, respectable, former and current uh, officials in government who are quite frank to say, yes, it's a, it's a significant danger and the results would be devastating. What does it mean personally for you? I mean, do you think this is something that will happen in your lifetime, your children's lifetime? Could happen tomorrow, or what do you think? Well, the good news for me is I'm much older than you are, yeah. so uh, the, the likelihood that it's gonna happen in my lifetime is significantly less than that it will happen in yours. Uh, but that it will happen in my children's lifetime and my grandchildren's lifetime, I think it's almost inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Uh, this is just a, it is a weapon system that is too appealing to too many people and too easily usable. Remember now, you don't need an Air Force. You don't need intercontinental, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles to deliver this system or nuclear submarines to deliver this system. Some guy with a laptop, if he is sufficiently well plugged in, mm -hmm. can do this. And do it with the knowledge that he may never be discovered. That's pretty scary. Right. So you think it's in terms of it's you know, less likelihood of happening in your lifetime, but you, it's, it's a real possibility, you A see? real possibility, so absolutely. I, so I gotta ask, I mean, are you, you personally, are, what's, what's in your basement pantry? Are you, are you stocked up? Are you I ready? Have, are you prepared? I have freeze-dried food, I have water. Yeah. Um, okay. And as do, I mean, I, I also purchased it for my children and grandchildren. Okay. Uh, I mean, it, it, the worst thing that'll happen is we have to use it in a, in a blizzard or a <laughs> hurricane, okay. uh, but at least it's there. Now, finally, on, on the issue of the book, uh, the issue of Lights Out, um, I get the sense that you, know, you, you, left, you left, left Nightline 10, 11 years ago, um, and you took on this book project a few years ago because you felt nobody was paying attention to this threat. Is it, 
I mean, do you see your role here as really kind of starting to sound the alarm and getting people to pay attention? I think my, I think my role, I think the role of journalists in general is to, is to make the public aware of potential threats uh, to our various aspects of our system and where we can to begin a political dialogue. Um, to a certain degree, that has already begun. I know that, that, that uh, there are a number of co congressional committees that are now looking into the, into the danger of cyber attacks and indeed have been doing so long before I, I wrote this book. It's just been going on rather quietly behind the scenes. Um, is Congress aware of the danger? Yes. Uh, is Congress, you know, our are any Congress people or senators prepared, or presidential candidates at this point, mm -hmm. prepared to come out and say, we believe that we have to take the following steps in terms of preparing ourselves for the likelihood of this kind of an attack? Not yet. But that's one of the things that, that we journalists are here to do, is to sort of shake the tree a little bit. Okay, and speaking of the presidential candidates have have any of them addressed this the the particular uh, scenario of an attack on the electric grid and is there any kind of political dimension to it right yes. left uh, I mean Jim Webb uh, who you may recall was briefly a candidate on the Democratic side yeah. uh, raised it and the issue sank without a trace uh, he raised it at one of the debates and got absolutely nowhere with it mm -hmm. uh, nobody else to the best of my knowledge has raised it, uh, and the fact of the matter is, uh, it's it's a very difficult issue to address. There are no simple answers, uh, and unfortunately, our political debates tend to focus more these days on issues with simple answers than ones that are really complex. And even when the issues are complex, we tend to get simple answers. Okay, so let me. Um uh, I want to ask you a couple more political questions, but I have a few more questions from our from our viewers. Um, uh, say Iran or North Korea gained the capacity to attack our grid, would we be able to attack them as well, or are they more protected and prepared for a cyber attack? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, I refer you, and you can go online to see it, just get one of these nighttime pictures of the Korean Peninsula. And what you will see is below the DMZ, South Korea is lit up like a Christmas tree. North Korea is essentially dark. Now, is North Korea well protected against a cyber attack? No, <laughs> but they have, so f they have so little electricity to begin with, and so few, I mean, I'm talking now about the North Korean people, they have so few items that are actually attached to the power right. grid including the lighting in their own homes, that it would have a disproportionately small effect on North Korea. Would it affect the leadership? Yes, it would. Would it affect the North Korean people? No, it wouldn't. The flip side of that is, which country in the world is the most connected to the internet? Probably yeah. we are, okay. which makes us the most vulnerable. Um, which. Okay, so that kind of ties me into a kind of a general journalism question, the connectedness we all are in. You left Nightline 11 years ago. That was before the Huffington Post, before Politico, before Twitter, before smartphones became ubiquitous. And so media news is all around and now. Right. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And you're 11 years outside of the daily news business. Um. I think on balance, it may be more of a bad thing than a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I judge the quality of journalism in general in this country, with the understanding that there are still examples of terrific journalism and extraordinary newspapers that are still out there, and I think NPR still does a fine job. and and PBS still does a fine job, but the fact of the matter is, in large measure, mass media and the level of journalism, I think, as, as media have fragmented 
And as we have more and more of the social media, I think the overall quality of journalism in general has, has deteriorated. So I don't think it's been good in that sense. And so as an outsider, not an outsider because you're still doing journalism, you're just not doing the daily, nightly journalism you right. were until 2005. Do you want to be in the mix? Do you miss it? No. 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 I mean, I would, I would love to see, uh, I mean, I hope the, the young journalists that, that you and I are going to be meeting with here, uh, I hope they dig in with both hands and feet. Uh, I think journalism is absolutely good journalism. Uh, constructive, solid journalism is absolutely essential to the real functioning of a republic like ours. And when, when journalism starts to go down the drain, the political system is not far behind. And I think the, the overall low quality of our presidential campaign mm -hmm. is in some large measure a function of the fact that journalism has also deteriorated. Uh, and that the vast numbers of people in this country are not reading the great newspapers, are not listening to NPR, are not watching PBS, uh, but are being exposed to a, a shoddy sort of surface journalism uh, that doesn't give them the kind of information that a well-informed electorate really needs. Now, does is the journalism there? The the public's just not seeking it out? Yes. Or is the journalism not there? No, I think the journalism is there. And, okay. and, and look, you can, use, you can use the internet to go online and get the most substantive, extraordinary, wonderful journalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at, uh, look, the fact of the matter is that Mr. Trump um, has, has uh, maximized the use of Twitter and Facebook so that I think collectively he probably has about 10, 12 million followers on the two. Um, Twitter, by its very nature, is not designed to be terribly substantive. Uh, it, is, it is a social medium. It can be used as a medium of journalism. Uh, you know, so can a chalkboard. Uh, but it's, you know, if you limit yourself to 140 characters, uh, the, the sort of in-depth reporting that our political system really needs and requires is probably not going to find its expression on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think, are we in a transition phase where we'll figure out how to make Twitter news, Facebook news, uh, fast-paced news relevant and more meaningful, and it's just a generational shift between your generation and mine and the younger one? Or do you think the medium of Twitter just doesn't lend itself to good journalism? I think the medium of Twitter just doesn't lend itself to good journalism. It lends itself to uh, the, the very fast and efficient exchange of basic information. And it can be enormously useful uh, at a time of, a, of a, uh, a physical crisis that's going on. For example, the revolution in, in Cairo, in Egypt. Uh, Twitter and Facebook were enormously helpful in communicating basic information. But that's not journalism as I've always understood it. Uh, and I think we need, we need both. We're never going to be able to, you know, I'm not suggesting that we ever get rid of Twitter or Facebook. You can't. Once it's out there, it's out there. Mm -hmm. But I am saying that we need a greater reliance on substantive, deep journalism. Uh, and to the degree that we marginalize journalism, we're going to end up marginalizing our political system too. Okay, I have uh, one or two more questions for you. The one way to get deep information on candidates is through debates. We've had 20 you debates. Th you, so th you think? In theory. <laughs> We've had 20 debates between among the Republicans and the Democrats this year with all kinds of different moderators and moderating styles. Right. Do you think, I mean, which, which have worked? Which, which of the, the moderating styles or the moderators do you think have done a good job in informing the well, primary me, voters? Let me put it this way. I think the most substantive approaches, I mean, A, 
it was much easier. In fact, it was almost it was almost obligatory that the that the democratic debates be more substantive because you only had two candidates after Jim Webb dropped out, um, and uh, Jim Webb and uh, the, the the unforgettable governor of yes. Maryland, right, Martin? You're Maryland. your governor. My governor. Yes. You're exactly right. Uh, once they dropped out, then you know having a uh, a dialogue in effect, or even a debate between two candidates when you have the same amount of time is by definition going to be more substantive than if you have a debate using the same amount of time among six or eight or ten or twelve candidates. Mm -hmm. As we come closer now to a, a much smaller field, one can hope, and indeed the last Republican debate was more substantive than any of those that have preceded it. Uh, I hope that continues. Uh, I think the best format has been the town hall meetings, where in effect the, the, the host, the moderator, uh, acts as an intermediary with members of the audience. Um, but you know, there's a problem when you allow members of the audience to take the role of journalists. Members of the audience are normally so intimidated mm -hmm. by the fact that they're finally getting a chance to talk to Hillary Clinton or talk to Donald Trump or talk to uh, you know, Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or Bernie Sanders, that they'll, they'll get that first question out. But where a follow-up is desperately needed, they're, they're either too intimidated or don't even think about the need to ask a follow-up. That's where real journalism ultimately comes in. Uh, and when you have a, a format in which very smart people are ultimately limited to giving answers that are either one minute or 30 seconds long, how much substance are you going to get? Okay. So finally, just playing it out a few months, would the, the potential debate between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, would that be a fun thing to moderate? Would you like to do that? I can't think of anything I would rather not do, quite <laughs> frankly. I, I think I would rather use a carrot peeler on my nose uh, <laughs> you know, than, to, than to moderate that debate. Okay. Uh, no, thanks very much. But I, I appreciate the offer. I'm, I'm asking on behalf of the Presidential Debate Commission, but I guess we'll, I'll tell them no. Tell them, tell them I'm thinking about it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, well, I really if, do. if you don't know, who does? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've been with Ted Koppel to talk about his fascinating book, Lights Out, um, a, a Cyber Attack, A Nation Unprepared, Surviving the Aftermath. It was out in October from Crown. And uh, I want to thank you very much for your time here. Um, you're My a pleasure. legend in the industry. And I, I was just reading that you have 6,000 uh, nightlines under your belt. So I, I do appreciate you taking the time for us here today. Thank you. Okay. So thank you for joining us today from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we make good journalists better. We've heard today from Ted Koppel on the prospect that the U.S. electric grid could come under attack and how we're nowhere near ready to cope with the calamity that could follow. Find more webinars and reporting resources at nationalpress.org and follow us on Twitter at NatPress. <laughs>